with this new book, Fury. I had no intention of writing a memoir in the beginning. Um, it was, I got to the topic, and in a very roundabout way, like a few years after Smashed, um, I'd been speaking with uh, some friends, and uh, they were saying, oh, you know, Corin, the female relationships, the friendships that you talk write about in Smash seem really intense, but also they ended sort of badly a lot of the time. And um, uh, someone had proposed, maybe I sit down and write a book about female friendship for my second book. And uh, that wasn't something that really appealed to me. I sat down and tried to give it a shot. And um, what came out wasn't about female friendship at all. It was about more about the way we handled conflict. Um, in my female friendships, which was mostly not to address it head on, um, to sort of drift apart over time. And um, it occurred to me that I was really writing about female anger. So um, that was the book I set out to write. I thought it was going to be this um, sort of objective, journalistic book of essays about American attitudes about anger and remedies for it. So I did a whole bunch of research. I um, looked up everything I could find from every perspective, sociological, uh, uh, psychological, I went to theologists, um, alternative medicine, you name it, I looked it up. Um, I went and stayed at a Buddhist center, I flew halfway across the country and attended this anger management seminar, the kind that you see in bad movies where people beat each other up with rubber mallets. And um, <laughs> I still, I really couldn't see why I was attracted to the topic until um, uh, I, I also fell in love when I was 26 years old and I am um, with this British singer-songwriter, and I, we did it transatlantically for a while, and then I moved to Britain to be closer to him, and um, in the process, subletted out my apartment in New York for a few months, and um, I, by the time I got over there to Britain, it wasn't even one month in, and we had this really explosive fight, the first fight we'd ever had, and um, instead of staying and talking it out, I, I literally packed my suitcase in front of him and took off on the next flight home back to America, um, uh, the next day and ended up crashing at my parents house for about a month and a half and it just felt like the worst place in the world to be as emotional as I was at the time we, we didn't handle emotion well in my family growing up um, we it always especially when people got angry um, seemed to make the family feel a little bit unstable um, it made people feel rejected on guard it just it wasn't good um, and so I was beginning to see that I had always been uncomfortable with anger which is of course why I'd glommed on to the topic, and um, I was beginning to see, too, how um, my childhood had a lot to do with that. So it, it only seemed right to um, clue my readers into that and turn it into a memoir. But that said, I was writing this book often, even as I was living it. I didn't quite know what the conclusion was going to be. It was, except to somehow preserve my sanity over the course of what felt like two years where the universe just kept giving me all sorts of reasons to be really pissed off. And I had now had to confront it because I wasn't drinking. And I, I used to confront, uh, deal with strong emotions by literally blacking them out. And that escape hatch wasn't available to me anymore. Um, I wanted to read to you a little bit. I almost want to give you the option because it's a Friday night. Um, uh, to hear about this anger management seminar I went to or about... Um, kind of disastrous on my wedding day with my immediate family, with my mom and dad. Um, which one would you be more apt to hear about? You can choose your own adventure tonight. <laughs> the wedding one? Or the wedding, okay. The wedding one. I should preface this by saying um, uh, this happens. Uh, I sort of am beginning to uh, work things out a little bit um, at this point. I am. I'm going to get married, actually, and get married um, in Paris, because um, I ended up finding my fiancé and I this apartment swap with these group of artists in this little town called Romaville on the outskirts of Paris, um, and what my landlady used to call the Bronx of Paris. And um, right before I left, I had literally the worst fight I've ever had with my parents, with my family, and our whole family history, just this terribly explosive fight where I still feel like I was sort of justified to be angry in the moment, but I also used it as an opportunity to pull out every axe I ever had to grind, with, especially with my mother, and try to really persuade her. Um, uh, uh, I wanted to make her see how I felt as a child and how I felt wronged by the fact that I hadn't been allowed to express certain emotions like anger. And it, it really, things escalated. Nothing productive came out of it. Just our, our family split apart a little bit. Um, but my parents do decide to come over to Paris for my wedding. My sister stays at home. Um, and so this is the first time I've seen them. And we've corresponded a little bit over the, 
the months since I've left, um, had a few phone calls, a um, few emails, but things are still pretty tense, and I think that's all you need to do. As my wedding nears, I grow panicked to the, oh, I should also say, um, I, I'm definitely not over the fight at this point, and I'm actually treating my mom a little bit like uh, the way I felt she treated me as a kid, and I do become a little bit of a bridezilla. <laughs> as my wedding nears, I grow panicked to the point of distraction. It's not that I'm nervous about committing my life to Amen or planning our tiny picnic reception. I'm not even concerned about how I'm going to rally the translator or pick up the croquembouche from a patisserie. The baker can't speak English. I can't speak French. We've had to establish a bumbling common ground in Spanish. I'm actually terrified to see my parents for the first time since our fight. On the afternoon of their arrival, my father is sweating like a field hand. My mother's complaining of blisters. They're both ticked off that our apartment is so far from the closest metro station. Eamon and I hug them tentatively, already feeling as though we've done something wrong. Maybe we should have met them at the airport after all. For the remainder of the day, the tension is palpable. My mother unpacks the suitcase full of small gifts she's brought for me. She seems to thrust each one at me tersely, a preemptive look of hurt on her face, as though she's already decided that I don't like or appreciate them. The more I thank her, the more closed off she seems to get. Sure, she says stiffly in reply. Don't mention it. She perches on the edge of our sofa with her arms crossed and her foot pumping at the end of her crossed legs. Later, when I ask her if something's wrong, if I've offended her in some way, she snaps back that she's fine. Not everything is about you, she adds. This last part makes Eamon laugh nervously. Her demeanor sets me on edge. It makes me despondent. It cocks me like a revolver. Things get worse the next day at my hen party. While Eamon spends his last day of so-called freedom go-karting, boozing, and getting hazed by his brothers, I spend mine at a flea market with our mothers and my future sister-in-law, Rachel, who arrives that morning looking roundly and happily six months pregnant. When we stop for croque madams, the conversation naturally veers towards my sister. My future mother-in-law makes some innocuous remark about how it's a shame that my sister isn't there to join us. Rachel, who hasn't heard the story, asks why not. And my mother, losing her chatty air, grows visibly defensive. She puts a fist to her mouth. Her spine straightens against her chair. She gives a combative speech about how my sister is not outlandish and her reluctance to cross an ocean with an 11-month-old baby. At the end, she throws her paper napkin onto the table and announces at high volume, now if you don't mind, that is, if no one else has any other questions about my youngest daughter, I'd prefer not to talk any more about her not being here. The wind is gone from my sails. I want the rest of the day, no, the rest of the weekend, to be over as quickly as possible. I wish I could skip the ceremony and go straight to being married. I understand now why my sister eloped. I suddenly want to celebrate this right with Eamon alone. How is it possible to feel protective of my mother and at the same time deeply furious with her? Later in the subway, she corners me while Rachel and my mother-in-law stand in line for metro tickets. What did you say to them? She asks me, her face flushed from the crowd in the heat of the day. What do you mean, what did I say to them? It's just the questions they were asking earlier. What did you tell them? Do they know about what happened before you left? I don't have time to ask her to elaborate. Rachel comes pushing her little belly through the turnstile and jaunts brightly toward us. They know, I say cryptically with narrowed eyes. I add cruelly, everybody knows. Eating ice cream cones later on Il San Louis, the conversation finally turns to the wedding, with everyone giving me marriage advice. My mother claims the itch didn't just happen on the seventh year, but also on the 14th, the 21st, the 28th, and so on. Rachel <laughs> claims the key to happily ever after is, claiming, is accepting that there'll be times when Eamon and I will be closer than others. You have to trust your relationship enough to give each other space from time to time, she says. Like an accordion, you'll constantly be moving apart from one another and then coming back together. I recount the story of our engagement for Rachel because she's never heard it before. When I'm finished, she turns and asks my mother, were you incredibly excited when you heard Eamon had proposed? My mother's face grows tight. She leans back on the stone wall where we're sitting above the Seine and dabs her mouth with her napkin. To be incredibly honest, I had my reservations, she said. I don't just interrupt, I can bust. We're not talking about any of that this weekend, I shout, while I stare downward at my dusty, sandaled feet. Some shame still keeps me from making eye contact with her when I'm angry. 